Good morning, Journey of Faith. It feels like we just met, kind of. But wow, weeks are going by quickly and we're moving closer and closer to meeting again in person. In fact, next week, uh, remember it's Father's Day, so this next week do something nice for your fathers or parents or whatever like that, okay? Let your dad know he is king, okay? All right. Well, let's get on to the sermon. Uh, open up your Bibles, James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. You know, being Asian American, I've always admired the resilience of Asian immigrants coming to America and finding success. When Chinese men came to the U.S. in the mid-1850s to find gold, they were confronted by a xenophobic citizenry who banned them from owning property or even taking claims on the gold mines. But that didn't detour them, as they simply opened businesses to help the miners. Laundromats, and restaurants, cooking, and equipment repair. And from there, they fanned out throughout California and the West Coast and went into farming and fishing and construction. In fact, they were the main source for the western side of the Intercontinental Railroad being built. The Japanese came along later and settled in Hawaii and along the West Coast and fared as well. And after the Korean War, Korean immigrants came as well, and they too have succeeded. The same for Asian students in the 80s to today. Uh, Vietnamese and Filipinos coming, getting a first-class education, either staying in the U.S. or succeeding and succeeding or going home and transforming their country. Well, a few months ago, the opportunity to succeed was high, right? With low unemployment and jobs abounding. Our entrepreneurial mindset has allowed for innovation and the creation of new industries. And how will Asians now do recovering from the pandemic? Well, my guess is, but I think it's an educated one, that they will eventually recover and Asian Americans will have success. And as I thought about it, I realized that the secret to this kind of success over the last 170 years for Asians in America is pretty much the same today as it was back then. What's the answer? Hard work. We call America the land of opportunity. It is. And if you are willing to put in the persevering and sacrificing effort to succeed, you will. Now, let me ask a question. Does that describe you? Does that describe how you want to raise your children? Isn't this a good thing? Well, in our continuing series on James, the Apostle is going to persuade us against our better judgment to have a different mindset. As well as intention as you and I are to plan out our lives and our children's future, James says that we are not necessarily in control. Look at verses 13 and 14. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Let's open with a word of prayer and ask God to bless this time. Father, Thank you that your church can meet, whether it's uh, online or in person, Lord, and that your word, whether it's online or in person, still has the same effect. I pray that I, as a preacher, would get out of its way and that your spirit would convict us to help us understand how we can become better followers of Jesus. We thank you, for in his name we pray. Amen. James begins his exhortation with a Jewish idiom. He says, now listen. It's as if he's pointing his finger right at us and saying, hey, take care. Pay attention to me, buddy. This is really important. He's describing a typical businessman, a Jewish merchant. This businessman, if we're honest, is someone whom we should admire. Look at how James describes him. He goes to this city or that. That speaks of having a well planned out strategy. He's a man who does his due diligence in, turn, in determining the best financial opportunities to pursue. He spends a year there. That is, he puts in the extra effort. Nothing comes easily. He has to take out the time to map out the details to ensure business success. He carries on business. After a lot of hard work and long hours, the successful businessman goes about executing his plan. And then finally, he makes money. He ultimately profits from all his hard work. 
Friends, that's capitalism. This is the American way. The pattern in business is the same whether we were speaking of the westward expansion, the Industrial Revolution, the explosion of the suburbs and highways in the 1950s, the Wall Street heyday of the 1980s, or the present entrepreneurial reality of high-tech startups. This was and is and will be the model for pursuing and achieving the American dream. Now, for those of you who came from immigrant families, it's the same model for success. Our parents, our grandparents, maybe even our great-grandparents lived out what James spoke of, didn't they? Go to the city or that, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. I applaud their early efforts, as should you. But if James was standing before us today, he would say that this Jewish model of business for success has two problems. Number one, my knowledge is limited. You and I, as smart as we are, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We plan with such confidence that we forget that we can't take into account all unforeseen circumstances. When people were making money like crazy during the dot-com era, little did they know, and thank God I was poor at the time, I couldn't invest, little did they know that it would eventually go bust. And just like the housing market a dozen years ago, it also ended in bust. And many of you or people you know over time bought property, heavily leveraged yourself, and had to declare bankruptcy. And we forgot to take into account that saying, past performance does not indicate future results. Even today, I feel for you graduating collegians. Maybe you have one in the home. Six months ago, the sky was the limit. Opportunities abound. But who would have thought a a pandemic would short-circuit your plans? And now I've heard that some of you, because of the job market kind of shrinking and going away, you're thinking about going on to grad school or doing it online, of course. What does that tell us? Our knowledge is limited. But secondly, that business model has a problem. That is, my life is unlimited, is is limited. Two weeks ago, George Floyd was killed by an officer who sat on his neck for eight minutes. It was horrific. But I guarantee you, George Floyd didn't wake up that morning saying, hey, I think my life is going to be snuffed out. In the ensuing days, police officers have been killed. Random shootings, break-ins, and lootings ending up with death, which is the collateral damage of the rioting going on. And then there's COVID. You may know someone who's contracted it, but even with over 100,000 deaths, do we know anybody personally who has died? And if you don't, Does it cause you or your children to be a little less cautious? We could die from it. Or think about the plane, the Malaysian airline, Flight 370. Those in the plane didn't know they were going to die. Or those who were in the crowds at the shooting in Las Vegas. Living in America, I think we get this false sense of security that people get hurt all over the world and around the country, but it just doesn't happen to me. We get that sense of false security. But the Apostle James reminds us in verse 14 that our life is like a fog, a mist. We're here now and then we will disappear. And by the way, that resonates for me, for a guy who comes from the San Francisco Bay Area. Because every day during the summer, a fog rolls in off the ocean and envelops San Francisco. But by 11 o'clock a.m., the fog dissipates and it's gone. And a biblical example of that truth is Abel, of Cain and Abel fame. The word Abel means mist. It aptly describes the younger brother who was there for a short time and then innocently and unexpectedly was no more because he was murdered by his brother. Life is limited, and you don't know when or how it will end. So if this is true that my knowledge and my mortality is limited. What's the alternative biblical way to think? Well, verse 15 gives it for us. He says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, but all boasting is evil. The problem with personal ambition is we forget to take into account what I call the God factor. James' alternative is that we replace our personal ambition with godly ambition, seeing the use of the statement, if the Lord wills. 
As Christ followers, we know that our very being is dependent on, upon the will of God. But even though you and I acknowledge it, we don't necessarily live that out daily, do we? Take, for example, you have a child in high school. The last four years have been focused on academic performance and extraordinary extracurricular activities, and you're pushing for a 4.2 GPA, 1450 on the SAT, first year and everything, and the results of all of our ambition is, is that they will get into a top-notch school. Or take for another example, if someone is sick with cancer, our first move is what? To go see a doctor and specialist and get an accurate diagnosis and try to eradicate that cancer with radiation or chemotherapy or surgery. The result of all this hard work is that we will defeat the disease. And one last example. You finished school, you gained a career, and now you're ready to pursue a lasting love interest. And you met someone who's compatible. Families love each other spiritually, financially. Everything is going well. You've done everything in your power to be ready for marriage. Things look good from our own vantage point. But what if it doesn't turn out good? In all these examples, how do you and I respond when things don't go our way? Super stellar student doesn't get to, into an elite school. Chemo doesn't cure the cancer. Your significant other calls off the wedding plans. Are you and I angry and frustrated because our plans didn't go as we thought? After being spiritually minded, we may even tack on that gratuitous, well, obviously it wasn't God's will, and that makes us feel better. May I suggest that what we feel at this point is not just disappointment, according to James. How we might respond might actually be sin. And you're saying to yourself, what? How could it be sin? Look at what James says right here in verse 17. He says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You know, I used to take this verse in isolation which is a sign, by the way, of poor interpretation. And believe James means the opposite of how we view sin. We talk it as the sin of commission. If we know something is wrong and we do it, it's a sin. If you and I steal, lie, or cheat, it's a sin. So I took this statement as the converse being true. That is the sin of omission. If we know what we're supposed to do and don't do it, it's a sin. A friend is in financial need and I don't help him. I'm not doing the good that I ought to do. It's a sin. My wife needs help around the house and I don't lift a finger. Sin of omission. It's a sin. It's the good that I ought to do, but I don't do it. It's sin. You have a group project at work and you're not pulling your weight. It's the good that you should have done, but you didn't do it. It's sin. There's racism and you know it, and you say, well, as long as I'm not involved with it, I'm okay, and yet you just let it pass. It's sin. Sin of omission. In all four cases, you know the good you ought to do, but you don't do it. It's sin. And I think this truth is biblical, and it's really the central truth Jesus makes in Luke chapter 10 with the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, we tend to focus on the Good Samaritan, the man who was not of the culture of the, of the beaten Jewish man, to help him. But there's also a sin of omission. Where? The Levite and the priest, they walk right by the man. That is a sin. James says that we need to watch that. What I believe James is saying in the context of personal ambition is that if you and I pursue our ambition with a tendency to maintain personal control and do it with self-assurance, boast, and brag, which means to have that proud confidence in our own knowledge or cleverness and what's going on. It's not only wrong, it's a sin. It's sinful because this self-assurance leads to arrogance and arrogance leads to pride and pride is a sin because it means that you and I believe in ourselves, not in God. And James says that this kind of boasting is evil because it's not or is it, does it show trust in God. So what's my point? Remember these words. If a person boasts about a personal ambition when he now has been told to humbly submit to God's will, then it's a sin. It's okay to be ambitious, but remember that we need to be ambitious for and through God trusting Him. Now let's bring this to a point of application. You may be asking yourself right now, how do I tell the difference between trusting in myself and trusting in God to run my life? 
Well, let's answer this question. When all of your efforts, when all of the things you do to get a better education and employment and relationships, basically every major decision that you are making in your life, if the intended outcome doesn't happen, you will be disappointed. But if your disappointment leads to frustration, anger, and an unwillingness to let go, most likely your desire comes from you. However, if you're disappointed, and you will be when you don't get the things that you want, but instead accept the results because you know that the Lord is sovereign and wants only what's best for you, then it's probably coming from God. That's the key. You're disappointed, but do you trust in yourself or do you trust God? I want to close it with a personal testimony because every example I gave you happened in my own life. The year was a long time ago, 1981. I graduated with a degree in fine arts, not exactly a marketable skill, right? And a minor in business. And I became a Christian all within one year. And God blessed me with a hunger for his word. And in spite of the difficult economic situation, I got a job with a major soft goods retailer, Mervyn's, whose headquarters just happens to be five miles from my home. Well, I continued to grow in my faith, teaching and leading in my young adult group. We started with about a dozen of us, but we grew to 120 in two years. God was really blessing us. I was part of a core leadership of eight men. I helped form a ministry called Torch, Testimonial Outreach Rooted in Community Help. We ran, I ran retreats. We, I wrote a weekly devotional. And while things were going well at church, at work, at Mervyn's, I received three promotions, received three consecutive five ratings. I was an expert in the replenishing system, such that the CEO of Dayton Hudson Corporation, the big corporation in Minneapolis, sat down with me to talk about it. And I didn't see at that time, but my self-assurance was becoming pride, both in my business acumen and also in my spiritual life. I was blessed, but that led to personal arrogance. And then in 1986, four years later, I went to pursue an MBA from Santa Clara University in the heart of Silicon Valley. And dreams of BMWs and big homes and six-figure salaries. I even had a Christian girlfriend. God blessed me. And in 1986, 34 years ago, I could paint a picture of my life that was incredible. I'm a godly Christian. I'm a successful businessman. I'm newly engaged. I bought my first home. And I did it in California working part-time. And then everything seemed to fall apart. Right before I started my MBA program, God impressed on my heart to pursue Christian ministry. I became an intern while working part-time as a senior financial analyst. But that move was career-limiting. And I saw my coworkers advance that I had been working with, and I was staying in my same position. And the girl and I were engaged, and she was a Christian counselor, but after some pondering felt that the effort to make our, work, our marriage work was too much and called off the wedding. Well, at least I had my church internship, and God was blessing my ministry, and I was expected to take a position as a college pastor in my own home church. But after two years, my mentor pastor and the senior pastor of the church both came to me, 70 years with combined experience, and said, Derek, we just don't see the pastoral gift in you. By 1989, three years later, everything that I put my trust in fell apart. I could say it's God's will, and I believed it, but I didn't really feel it. But here's a lesson I learned 34 years later. When God takes something from us, his intention is to replace it with something better. I didn't see it at the time, but my life in 2020 is a living testimony to letting my personal ambition give way to God's ambition. I couldn't call it back then, but 34 years later, I did go on to be a pastor in spite of my mentor pastor and senior pastor saying I didn't have the pastoral gift. But it wasn't in my hometown, and it wasn't in a large mega church, Anglo uh, church, but in a Chinese church in another state. And I would never have called it that way. But I did retire after 26 years of ministry in the same church. 
as a Chinese American, that is near impossible. And there are less than this many guys who've done it in the entire country. It is that rare. I was engaged twice before and twice rejected, which should tell you something. But eventually, I did get married to the most godly and accommodating woman I know. I don't know why she picked me. I'm sure today she doesn't even know why she picked me. But God had it planned out. And being an older guy when we got married, I never thought I would have children. But we have three children. And even now, as an older guy, the first one is leaving the nest. And finally, I'm blessed that you all, Journey of Faith, have allowed me to continue to minister and help you in this transition period. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm willing to wait on the Lord and find out. And if He wills, I will do this or that. The question is not about me. God has worked through my life, and I'm thankful to see whether I've got one year or 20 years or whatever years left, what He's going to do. He's proved Himself faithful. But what about you? Do you trust the Lord to take your life? Talk about your ambition. Think about it. Your future, your dreams. And ask yourself these, this. Are they from God or are they from me? Let's look for God's will. Yield and do what he wants us to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. and Thank you that we can meet together and ask these hard questions. And ponder, Lord, as we're perhaps younger, to think about the direction that we're going in life. Is it from you or is it from us? Holy Spirit, help us to discern that and to live for you. We're going to thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Do something good for your dads or your single parents. Uh, you kids, do something good for your mom or dad. And we will see you next week. Shalom.